here today. Uh, Anna Grace and I were out of town last weekend. Really enjoyed listening to Tim's sermon and uh, really appreciated him <coughs> preaching last week. And the week before that was our weird no church in town that week uh, because of the weather that, that never happened. So <coughs> it would have happened if we would have been here. Guaranteed. <laughs> Uh, we are continuing on in our um, series on busyness. Um, there's a, a quote that we've been using to kind of as a little bit of a, of a guide through this. Uh, we'll just read it again because I think it's helpful to just keep this, this definition in front of us. Busyness is an inner condition. It's a condition of the soul. It means to be so preoccupied with myself and my life that I am unable to be fully present with God, with myself, and with other people. I'm unable to occupy the present. Moment. So this is what we're looking at, and as we go through week to week, we're looking at different um, temptations or things that can be obstacles uh, for us, things that can create a preoccupied soul. Last week, Tim looked at uh, the idea of service, that depending on what our motivation is behind uh, service, some of us can be uh, very busy and preoccupied serving, um, but never have any time to actually sit and experience the Lord. Uh, today, we will look at a, a different uh, category of, of something that can create a preoccupied soul, and that is uh, what we're calling the fear of others. If you look throughout Scripture, you'll see two categories contrasted throughout the Scriptures. One is the fear of man, or fear of others, or the fear of the Lord. And so the question that we'll look at as we consider these two categories is, is this. Which one of those two categories is currently controlling your life? Are you controlled by other people and what they think about you and in trying to be accepted and approved by them or in trying to meet their expectations or what you think their expectations are of you? Are you controlled by that or are we controlled by a regard for the Lord and living before Him? That's the question we're going to look at. I think this is an important issue. Here's why I think that. Um, it's because I realized this morning at 5 o'clock when I was up putting some finishing touches on this sermon with a two-year-old in my lap. I realized I have been pummeled by this all week. Like, I've just had an awful week. I've just, there's been discouragement. There's been heightened sensitivity to what other people think about me. And it just came together at 5 o'clock this morning that I think probably the reason for that is because that's what I'm preaching on today. That tends to be how the enemy works. If we're going to highlight something and draw attention to it, then he's going to pummel us with it all the way to the, to the point uh, where we're actually talking about it. And so because of that, I just feel like this is probably something that we're dealing with, that, that, that this is something that's a struggle for many of us, perhaps. Being controlled by other people. Uh, that can show up in a variety of ways. Let me just give some to you. So just get ready to be convicted. Uh, that can show up in, in peer pressure, this is a term that shows up in youth ministry a lot. Teenagers, you see a group of peers doing something. You want to be cool and fit in, and so you do it. Being controlled by other people. Peer pressure. Um, another way that can show up is by overcommitment. 
you think that everybody has this expectation of you that you need to commit to everything and do everything, and so you get so busy, preoccupied, doing all that stuff just to try and be approved and accepted by others. Sometimes this shows up by going to whatever length you can to avoid other people. Think about a hermit. Is a hermit's life controlled by other people? You better believe. To the point that he's going to whatever length he can go to to get away from people. That's living under the control of other people. Another way this can show up is by being overly concerned and consumed by our own appearance. Like we think we have to look perfect all the time in order for other people to accept us and approve of us. People create entire lifestyles around Um, a final way that this can show up is that we simply enjoy looking successful in front of other people. And in fact, we secretly delight in the struggles and failures of other people. Or we see something good happen to someone else and we're not happy for them, we're jealous of them. Shows up in a lot of ways. It's a big deal. And we can get so busy and active and preoccupied with those kinds of things that we completely throw out the door any kind of fear of the Lord. And so we have to look at that. Because that dynamic creates a lot of busyness, a lot of soul preoccupation. And so we'll do that today by looking at a passage in Matthew chapter 10. Now, I stated when we started this series that I really wanted to use the Gospel of Luke as a background for this series. This information is in Luke, um, but it's, it's presented more clearly in Matthew, and so I just I want to kind of um, spend, spend our time in Matthew today. Probably no one else cares about that except me, but I have to so. Um, <coughs> Before we jump into the passage, let me just set up a little context. Jesus here is sending out his followers, his disciples, to go and minister, to go and make disciples, which is the calling of all of us. Right? If I'm a follower of Jesus, my calling in life is to make other followers of Jesus in these specific places that he's put me with these specific gifts and abilities that he's given me, which looks different for all of us. Right? We've talked about that several weeks ago. He's sending these disciples out to make disciples, and he, he warns them, get ready for opposition. Get ready for a life that is not going to be warmly received by everyone. Because he, he says to them, you're, you're about to cut against the grain of society. You're, you're about to cut against the grain of the kingdoms of this earth because you're living for uh, God's kingdom, my kingdom, Jesus' kingdom. Uh, and, and when you do that, it's not going to be warmly received. And so you're going to be threatened by other people. Now, in this context specifically, um, he talks about them being threatened by their own physical life being taken away. I don't think any of us are in danger of that this morning. Um, now that we have brothers and sisters around the world who certainly are. Um, but really none of us are in danger of losing our life or we're living out our faith, at least not in this society, in the day-to-day -day life that we live. But there are, many, there are certainly ways, many ways, that we are threatened by other people. That we allow other people to control us. And so what I want to do is I want to see how Jesus um, talks about this and pull out four principles that he draws out about the kind of uh, opposition that we may experience as we seek to live for him. Now, um, the first, there's four that we'll look at on the back of your bulletin. So if you want to take notes, there's four of them. The first three are all fairly similar. Because they all deal with um, things that we can expect to experience from those who are not following Christ as we cut, we, as we cut against the grain of culture. All the first three are surround that. 
The last one is a doozy. Because the last one deals with being controlled by others or people pleasing, not by opposition from culture, but by dynamics in those who are closest to our hearts. And so some of us may skate, uh, get through the first three unscathed and get nailed by the world. <coughs> Just be ready. Just tell me. All right, four perspectives that Jesus points out. Starting in Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 and 27, we'll read and pull out our first principle. So, have no fear of them. Jesus is referencing authorities who might want to uh, oppose the, the disciples, perhaps kill them. So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. So he's sending out his disciples, and he says, hey, as you go and you share this message, there's going to be some folks who oppose you, even perhaps to the point of death. And he says here, hey, don't have any fear of them. Because what Jesus realizes is, is that they're going to have, there's going to be a temptation that arises uh, in a particular moment when the disciples are tempted to compromise their, their following the Lord in order to uh, not be killed. So at the threat of other people, they may compromise how they're living out their faith. And Jesus says, don't do this. Don't do this. He says, uh, put yourself out there. Be motivated. To live sincerely and genuinely regardless of what the external outcome is. He says, uh, proclaim what you know. Why? Because God sees our hearts. This is our first principle here, that God sees internally. God knows what is motivating you and me. And so if I start altering how I live, because I am internally um, um, controlled by other people and my fear of other people and meeting their expectations, if I'm inwardly controlled by that and I'm living out of that motivation, God sees that. He sees that. We have to account for that before Him. Paul, Paul addresses this in uh, his letter to the Colossians where he's talking to servants who, who serve in a household. And he says, uh, servants, don't serve as people pleasers. He actually uses that term. But serve from a sincere and a genuine heart as though you're serving the Lord because God knows your motivations. He sees your motivations. I used to talk about that, this in youth ministry a lot when we would talk about obeying your parents. And I would tell teenagers, hey, it's not enough for you to just be externally compliant to your parents. Right? Like you can take out the trash if your parents ask you to do that, and have a terrible attitude doing it, and it doesn't count as obedience. <laughs> and some teenagers that have real problems with that. Fiction. But that's true, right? I mean, God knows what motivates us and what drives our external actions. He sees our hearts. This is what he tells the prophet Samuel when he goes to choose the next king, King David. He says, Samuel, be careful. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. If you and I are living more for the approval of others rather than the approval of God, God sees that. We might be able to trick other people around us. We might even be able to trick ourselves to an degree, but He sees it. He sees it. Jesus brings out this principle to us to, to warn us against doing that. All right, second principle. Next verse, verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. <laughs> this, is, this is heavy language. Um, Jesus says here, basically, in a nutshell, the worst thing they can do is kill you. The worst thing they can do. Um, and so, don't allow that to cause you to compromise being sincere and genuinely walking out your faith. The worst thing they can do is kill you. But, 
he tells his disciples here, um, that's, that's a temporary thing. For those who follow Christ, death is not the last chapter. There is a resurrected eternal life with Christ. And so uh, just because they can temporarily cause harm to you doesn't mean they can do anything to you eternally. And this is our second principle is that God sees eternally. God sees eternally. Some of us are so driven by temporal things. Some of us are so consumed by the desire to be liked, by the desire to have acceptance and approval from others, that it is causing us to not think eternally. And that's not good. Any kind of being not liked by others or being embarrassed in front of others or, or loud or like play out, it's all temporary. It's all temporary. It's not going to move to, to pass over into eternity. But to come before God and have to admit that I have in my entire life trying to be accepted and approved by others and I never really got around to what it means to be accepted and approved by you, that's bad. Because at that point it's eternal and there's eternal consequences. Now, um, some of us, it, it can be difficult to live in this way because it's uncomfortable. To live genuinely and sincerely before the Lord is uncomfortable and it's going to bring difficulties. I love the story where David, who's serving as the king in Israel, they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Israel. They've captured it from the Philistines and they're bringing it back into uh, Jerusalem and, and the Ark of the Covenant. And I mean, it is a party. And David, I guess says at any good party, starts taking his clothes off. And he's like, basically in his underwear. And he's dancing in the streets before the people. Because dude is excited about the Ark of the Covenant coming back into Jerusalem. And then he gets home. To the missus. <laughs> she says to him, What were you doing? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> oh, great king, dancing naked in the streets. <laughs> and God rebukes her, renders her childless. She was more concerned about the approval of others than the approval of the Lord. Any rejection, not living up to people's expectations, all that's temporal. David saw past that stuff. He was a living for what was eternal. Big deal. Number three, verses 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny. Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Some of us just need to hear verse 31 this morning. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. A sparrow is cheap. You can buy one for a penny. It's like buying a goldfish for a pet, right? <laughs> no hassle, it's cheap. Dies flush it down the toilet, right? It's cheap. What God's doing here is he, He's starting to talk about value. Or as I would call it, economics. Number three, God sees economically. I have an economics minor, so I like economics. I don't know what that does for me in life, but economics is all about value. Cost, benefit, analysis, all of these things. God here starts making value statements about those who belong to Him. And, and, and Jesus references God and He, he says, um, even the cheapest little animal 
God knows every moment of its life up to the very last moment of its life when it dies. He sees it. It has value because He made it and it's His and it belongs to Him. Jesus goes further and He, 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 uh, he draws attention to this massive attentiveness to detail that God knows about all those who are His own, that He knows how many hairs are on their heads. God, right now, in about a second and a half, could make a list of every person in this room with the exact number beside their name of how many hairs are on their head. And Jesus wants, to know, wants us to know that because He wants us to see how God approaches value because it's the exact opposite of how the world approaches value. The world hands out value based on what a person can produce. You're a good employee and you bring in a lot of money for your company and so you have value. Or you don't and you have no value. You're a parent and you turn out good kids, you have value. You're a parent whose kids don't turn out that good and you don't have any value. You're a student and you make good grades, you have value. You're a student who makes bad grades, you don't have any value. The way that the world assigns value is by what we can or cannot produce. It's the exact opposite of how God bestows value. And some of us are so consumed trying to create value for ourselves by what we can produce and by comparing ourselves to others and by thinking if I fail I must not have value that we're not coming to Christ and being controlled by His love and realizing that the Father offers value to us because He loves us through Christ. Not because of what we produce or don't produce. We have to work in God's economy, not man's economy. Stop trying to produce value for yourself by what you produce. It's not how God assigns value. He bestows value. It's a given. It's grace. And it comes through Christ. So all of these are ways, principles, that Jesus uses to warn us about the danger of living with a higher regard for people and their expectations of us than we do regard for the Lord. To be a follower of Christ is to cut against the grain of society. It is to look different. It is, as Peter says, to be a stranger and an alien here in this life. Alright, you might have come through all those unscathed. And now we've got to do it over here. Verses 34 to 37. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace. But a sword. I have come to set a man against his father. And a daughter against her mother. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The fourth principle is that God sees relationally. God knows 
which relationships are the most important relationships in our lives? What is your most important relationship right now? Jesus says here, there is no relationship that is allowed to compete with a person's relationship with me. This is a deeply convicting text. Because Jesus knows that the relationships which will be the, the most temptation for us when it comes to people pleasing is those who are closest to us. Those who are nearest and dearest to us. And he states very clearly right here, even your dearest, most closest relationships cannot take precedence over your relationship with me. It is possible to focus too much on our marriage. <coughs> it is possible to focus too much on our children. As one commentary said that I read, it is possible to have a successful, functioning family where no one loves Jesus. Parents, some of, some of us are losing our minds because we are so afraid that our parents or that our kids are not going to turn out the way we want. We're consumed by it. It controls us. And that is a sin. If we're living like that, it's a sin. Because our kids have more control of us than Jesus does. Some of us, some of us right now, have marriages where we don't like our spouse at all. And if we could, we would change as much about our spouse as we possibly could. And we're so focused on that that it's controlling us more than Jesus. And that's a sin. Do you see how dangerous people pleasing is? Do you see how insidiously it can creep into our hearts so that those who are nearest and dearest to us have more control over us than Jesus does? If this is in our lives, we have to repent of it, we have to confess it, and we have to look to Jesus. It cannot be our families that are most important if they are competing with our relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> what is the response to this? Jesus provides one here. Uh, it's actually a two-part response. The first part comes in verses 32 to 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I love that Jesus here twice, he refers to God as Father. Ultimately, the key to living more with a regard for the Lord uh, than we do for a regard for others is to experience God as a Father, a perfect Father who loves us perfectly, and the only way that can happen is when we acknowledge Christ. God is not the Father of all people. He's the Creator of all people, but He's not everyone's Father. You can only experience God as Father when you come to Him through Christ. So what does it look like to acknowledge Christ? Uh, Jesus picks this up in verse 38. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. To acknowledge Christ means that I come to the end of myself. And I'm no longer trying to create an identity for myself that is based on how other people approve of me or accept me. 
I come to the end of myself. And in fact, I, I repent and confess before Christ that my attempt to create an identity for myself apart from Him is a sin that is punishable by death before God. And then I realize that Christ has taken that death on Himself. He has died in my place so that He can forgive me of trying to create an identity outside of Him. He, he puts to birth in me His resurrection life so that now I am no longer living for myself, but I am living for the One who died for me and was raised for me. The response to this is to look to Christ. To look away from ourselves and to look to Christ. This is exactly what Jimmy talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That the love of Christ controls us when we receive uh, Christ so that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for Him. And Paul continues on in that passage and says, Therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. In other words, it reorients the whole way we approach and view people. And we're no longer trying to get them to approve of us or accept us, but now we are on mission with Christ to reconcile other people to God the Father through Christ, just like we have experienced. That's what life is all about. But it comes by being accepted by God as a perfect Father, by acknowledging Christ, coming to the end of ourselves and receiving His life in our place. What is the greater dynamic in your life this morning? Fear of others or fear of more? If it's fear of others, then I can almost guarantee you have a life filled with busy, incessant activity that is preoccupying your soul. Proverbs puts it this way. Fear of man lays a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Can we just do that? Just hide just hold that like that. Down. To live in a way where I am controlled by others is to buy into a trap. It's a snare. Sucks life out of us. The contrast to that is to take our eyes off of looking to other people and to trust in the Lord. And I love that word that he uses to describe that there, that those who trust in the Lord are safe. If you are in Christ this morning, you are safe. I don't care if you feel safe or not. You are safe. You have been declared safe. Whether you feel it or not, you are safe. So why leave the safety to live in the snare? I want us to take some time to respond to this this morning. We'll sing a couple of songs that help us do that. Um, we have prayer teams that line our walls each and every Sunday. If those who are on our prayer teams this Sunday will go ahead and move to the wall. They're there for those um, who may want to pray with someone.